All right. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Design Recharge. This is episode 249. I'm really excited. We got 250 right before Creative South. Mm -hmm. But I was so excited Lisa could do a part two so quickly. So it was Lisa Glanz, Lisa Quine, and then Lisa Glanz again. So we, you back, <laughs> we, we got all the Lisa's. <laughs> yeah, lots of Lisa's. So we talked two weeks ago, I think, uh, we talked about your kind of journey from being a designer to being an illustrator mm -hmm. and then some of the battles, the mental battles. And then, so today I kind of sent you a couple new questions, but definitely the rest of the questions that we hadn't gotten to answer. So thank you, Lisa, so much for coming back today. Pleasure. It's so nice to be back. I'm so glad to have you back. So we're just going to jump in. So after the last um, episode, I got a ton of response. People were like, this was incredible. Great episode. I learned a lot. And you kind of gave some hope to a lot of people, I think. Oh, I'm so glad to hear that. So I want to kind of dive in. Um, one mm. of the things that we didn't get to talk about last time that I really appreciate um, is that you are kind of representing women on the Ooh. Honest Designers podcast, right? <laughs> so sometimes yeah. I sort of feel bad for you, but sometimes I sort of feel bad for uh, uh, Ian too, because y'all railroad him about his Bob the Builder guy. <laughs> yeah. But um, but you definitely stand on your own. And I think that it's, we were talking before just about that group. Um, and I feel like it's it is really cool that you have some, people that you meet with that are doing the same thing as you yeah. that are doesn't even matter where they are because they have the same sort of struggles. Yes. Right. So yeah, how, so important. how, um, cause I really do feel like a lot of times you are representing, um, you know, half the population and, and in the United States, I think there's 51% women designers. It may mm -hmm. be a little bit I may be a little bit off, but we, we have a little bit more than the men as designers, which I think is pretty cool. Um, and you always do such a great job representing women. I think, oh, um, you, thank you. Uh, you're a really strong business person and you have really good, uh, business savvy. I know you might not always, but sometimes I feel like, Oh, well maybe it's just cause I'm a, a girl that I didn't that I feel like this, or I feel bad for something. So there's been many shows on the Honest Designers podcast that you're like, what? Like Ian or Dustin are like, <laughs> well, I just felt bad. So I didn't want to charge. And you just, so there was just never anything. We talked a little bit about that, but there is, mm. it, that is definitely strong um, person, you know, not, not women or men, just strong. And I feel like that's kind of a, it, maybe it is because we're more sensitive and we yeah. kind of dipped into that a little bit. Mm. And I don't know if you have any uh, for future for further comments, I guess, about that or maybe transitioning. Because have you always felt like that? Have you always been that strong? Okay, so how did you, because that's another huge jump for people, mm. I think. Can you talk a little bit about that part of the journey? Yeah, I think, I mean, as with everything, I probably learned it the hard way because, you know, you if, you, if you're too soft, people walk all over you. That's just the way it is. It's unfortunately um, human nature. I, I actually think it's nature in general. Um, you know, if the, the strong will survive kind of thing. Um, so it's, you basically, the bottom line is no one is going to be fighting for you out there voluntarily. So the only person that's actually really doing that job or going to do that job is you. Um, I guess you can pay someone to do this, but, <laughs> but in terms of actually standing up for yourself, your abilities, your skills, your um, talent, whatever, it's, it's literally just going to be you. So um, it did take me a while to figure that out. And I learned that fastest when I started freelancing. I think when I worked for a company, I was terrible. I, I literally... I mean, I would, I would be taken advantage of. I never stood up for myself because, you know, you feel like you, you can't like you, uh, you know, you feel like someone's paying your salary. You have to do what they say and you can't rock the boat. And, you know, so that, that was, that was a bit tough. Um, needless to say, I did, I did work way too many hours, you know, for nothing and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> um, but sometimes so, that's part of just paying your dues in design, I is. think to some extent, I, but so I don't I'm think it's healthy. 
Right. No, right. I'm, but I'm glad you mentioned that because I actually don't regret that, even though it was horrible at the time. I'm actually glad I went through that because it it formed a basis for me how I didn't want to feel. I didn't mm. want to feel taken advantage of. I didn't right. want to feel like I'm working so hard for nothing and it's not mine even and all that kind of stuff. So mm. it really contributed to me being pushed more and more and more into fighting for my own little space in the world and 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 you know going out and freelancing on my own. So I, I just realized, you know, what's the point of putting all this effort, all this energy uh, into another person's company when I can be doing that for myself and, and all this kind of, all these little lessons that you learn along the way, the hard way, they actually really help you and shape you to become more confident and become more business sense because you've been through, you've been through the mill, you've been through horrible stuff and hopefully you learn from it, you know? Um, right. Yeah. And, and the thing with the standing up for yourself, it is so, especially for women, it really is hard. We, for some reason, we just, I don't know if it's a DNA thing or what it is, or if it's a social thing. Um, but because we're nurturing by nature and we are more sensitive by nature, we feel bad. Mm -hmm. We feel bad easily. We, um, when we, when we feel like we are, you know, blowing our own trumpet we start thinking wow that's arrogant how can you be like that but quite honestly it's it's not blowing your own trumpet it's just basically choosing your side you know um it's it's if you, if you look at the whole the whole game of life it's like a game there are two teams and you you won the one team and the rest of us and the other i mean there's no point in joining that team and no one's looking out for your side you know so you have to do that for yourself and um and i'm not saying be rude and arrogant and uh, but I am saying that you have to, you've got to believe in yourself. You've got to be the first person to believe in yourself because if you don't, then you just never grow and you never get confident enough to, to take those next um, steps that are required to grow. You know, um, you know, we, we, we've, before this call, we started talking about, you know, joining groups and stuff. And when I first um, hooked up with Dustin and Ian and Tom, I mean, I was petrified. I, I, I just, it was, it's, it was totally out of my comfort zone to be like doing, I mean, even this, what I'm doing now, I, and the only reason why I'm comfortable doing this now, because I've been doing the podcast for so many, you know, weeks or whatever. And it's it, the only way you can actually push yourself out of your comfort zone and, and start trying all these little new things is to start believing that you can, and you have to be confident in yourself, um, you know, to take those steps. So it's so important from every aspect of life, I guess. Absolutely. Yeah. So you've mm. talked about a couple of things that I wanted to touch on. One was just having clear boundaries. So, yes. so there's, um, there's a book about boundaries at work. I mean, there's a book about boundaries and your home life or whatever, but really having clear boundaries at work. And I remember there would be times where I worked for a magazine and I would stay till six in the morning and then I'd go home, take a shower and I'd come right back and I'd get back at 10, you know? Yeah. And I, I also am glad that I did it. I do feel like I had some ownership, but a lot of it was just, it, it was just the grunt work, right? So some of it's a, that you have this kind of shared thing that you can connect with other people who are younger than you who are going through it now, you know, if you yes. can remember what that feels like. Mm. But I always, my best friend, Tara, she was able always, she had a nine to five. She got there at nine. She left at five. She's like, oh, I'm not doing anything else. And I was like, how does, how do you not have to do? And she's like, we leave at five. And I'm like, oh, well, it's not done at five. <laughs> so <laughs> she always had clear boundaries. And I think yeah. she worked at places that also, so I think it's in the, in the atmosphere, it's asking some of those questions up front, yeah. what's expected. But when you're new, you don't know to ask, Hey, no. am I going to have to stay till three in the morning <laughs> exactly. alone, you know, or six in the yeah. morning or something like that. And I do think a lot of it's just experience, right? Mm. It is. I mean, as you said, your, your friend, because she has those clear boundaries, she, she would never work for a company that we did where we were meant to, you know, expect it to stay till six and then come back, shower, come back and work again. So um, it is exactly what you said. It's down to experience. And uh, yes, all, you know, all those new designers out there that are struggling with this, it is horrible. And it does feel like you are being taken advantage of. And the truth is you probably are. Um, 
But I have to also say that there's something about paying your dues as a, as a junior and, and, and kind of like earning your stripes, if I can call it that. I'm proud that I was one of those people. I mean, I know people that, that kind of jumped from college and then found a cushy job and they never really went through, you know, they weren't in the trenches ever. And because of that, I think they never get pushed and they never got mm. pushed to explore new avenues and, and figure stuff out about yourself. Like, gosh, this is not what I want to do. Or I love the, the intensity of the deadline, but I rather would be doing it for myself. Or, you know, you, you discover so much about your creative abilities, working under pressure, working when you're tired, you know, all those kinds of things. And I'm really glad that I earned those stripes. Um, but, but yeah, let's, uh, the, the truth is we were taken advantage of, you know. So, but it's, um, there's a friend that I know that still kind of works like that and he's much older. So I think it's that, that um, you know, the feast or famine, you go through that, especially if you work for yeah. yourself, right? You take mm. on way more, you just will take anything because you just need to pay your bills. And so yeah. you get hopefully to a point we talk about that point a lot on design recharge because it's like that point of hey i can go on my own i don't have to work for somebody else this doesn't have to be so it's kind of like splitting that side hustle to being full-time gig but i think believing in yourself and knowing what your worth is is something Mm. a lot of people even a non-junior designers but they still are living like junior designers do you know what i mean like yes i do um I would say that that's, I mean, unless it's a choice, unless that that's, that they thrive on that. Cause there are some designers <laughs> that do. I mean, honestly, <laughs> some designers just love that. Like, please just give me too much work so I can actually work. You know, some people hate the fact that you get given too long and they just never get the job done. So unless it's your choice, I still think you need to evaluate that. If you, if you've done your time, it's time for you to choose yourself and move on. And by choosing yourself, that either means, more time with your kids and family um, or building your own business or trying an alternative or, you know, whatever. But yeah, I I think working to death and, you know, almost being a martyr about it, I think Mm. is not helpful. It's not helpful. Well, and I think another thing that you said earlier, it's Mm going to be uncomfortable. You're going to have times where it's going to be uncomfortable. So if you felt like this and you felt taken advantage of, to stand Mm -hmm. up for yourself or to say, Hey, this is what I'm worth. It's going to feel weird until you've done it a few times where it doesn't feel weird anymore. And it's kind of like, there's a, that Amy Cuddy video that I, I think I sent it to you. Maybe anyway, if not, I'll make sure I send it to you this time. Um, but it was the, you know, uh, she says, um, fake it till you, um, become it, not fake it till you make it, but fake it till you become it. Because it's like you were uncomfortable on the honest designers in the beginning because this was something new, but now mm. you've done it so many times, it's not uncomfortable anymore. No, it's you know, it becomes something that's natural. And um, it's like when I have my first few clients that that challenged my costing, you know, I would say, Gosh, that's so expensive. Um, you know, I'm used to paying X and not this the first few times it was, it was terrible to say like, you know, I wanted to die. I wanted to like, am I, am I really going to tell this guy that, Hey pal, it's like, you know, I'm worth it. You know, you pay it all. <laughs> um, obviously I didn't frame it like that, but that was essentially what I was doing. <laughs> yes. And, and, and the thing is you, it, yes, of course it's going to, it's going against your grain. It's going against all these like, societal things that have been telling you you can't say that you just should be grateful for the work you just accept it you know um so it is challenging all these pre-notions that you have in your mind um that either you were you know taught or society told you to think like that or whatever um so it it will be hard but you've got to push through you've got to do it at least three four times and before you know it it's like you don't even question it anymore it's like if somebody challenges you, you just say look I understand that you're used to paying that and you will always find somebody cheaper than me. In fact, you'll find somebody more expensive than me. But the truth is I come with experience. You're paying for my expertise. You're paying for my knowledge. You're paying for all those hours that I've put in ahead of time, uh, you know, on previous projects. So you're getting all of that, you know, in, in all dedicated to your particular project that I'm working on. And you need to get it across that, 
that it's not just the time, the physical time that he's paying or they're paying for. They're paying for the fact that you spend hours after hours researching. You spend hours improving mm. your skills. You've spent hours on previous jobs. So you have knowledge of what it's like to do a corporate identity. That's what they're paying for. They're paying for that expertise. And, and you, yes, of course, you can go down the road and get it done by Joe Soap, who's never done it before and charges him half the price, but then he's just going to get crap, probably. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, you're yeah. going to end up, and, and, and maybe it's talking about that. So Kim said, it's such a struggle. So she had said this earlier when we were talking about maybe our worth. Um, I hate when I walk away feeling like I've given myself away. And then she yeah. said, Lisa, what gave you the courage to say, hey, this is my number. This is the amount. Um, because it, it is uncomfortable to do that. So did you yeah. do the research? So somebody was kind of like, oh, this Kim again. She said, did you know what the growing rates were from your creative director days? Or did somebody tell you, hey, listen, you need to charge more? Um, actually, it was a bit of a combination of both. I accidentally stumbled upon another person's quote, which is always helpful because then you can see what the, you know, your, your peers are, are charging. Um, and I was horrified to see that I was almost half the price. Wow. And I knew that my quality of work, again, this sounds arrogant, but I'm not going to apologize for it. I knew my quality of work was the same, if not better. Mm -hmm. So why should I be charging, you know, much less? Um, and <laughs> this sounds incredibly uh, manipulative, if that's the right word. But the other thing I used to explain to clients <laughs> was that because I'm a one-man show, I can offer the same services that, a, that an ad agency can offer. Because I knew I was way cheaper than an agency. Way, way, way cheaper. I mean, let's face facts. Agencies are mm. so expensive. I would literally tell them I can offer you the same services that an agency can for a fraction of the price because I don't have staff and I don't have overheads like they do. So you'll be getting the same quality work that an agency would be producing. And sometimes actually even better. I mean, I often went head to head with an agency and what I produced versus what they produced was a lot better because I was focused. Whereas an agency, as you all know, you know, one person's doing this part and another person's doing that part and no one's really like controlling the whole mm -hmm. project as one properly, whereas my heart and soul was being poured into the project. So you, you got to find ways to explain all these benefits that the, the client is getting from the fact that they're going to use you and you are literally so into their product and brand and making it work that, that it's a win-win for both. Um, I totally agree. You know how Tom will always be like, okay, guys, I think they're going to make a PDF. We need to make a PDF of this. You know, he says yeah. that a lot. I'm telling yes. you, Lisa, there's a ton of tactics. You need to make an ebook and sell it because, yeah, probably do. <laughs> because there's so much in there, like just phrases or mm. that, what to say, like yeah. how do you approach it? And yeah, yeah. Mm, and I really I do feel like you have a, a huge uh, impact and your voice is Man, I, I'm, it's hitting home, I think, for a lot of people. And so Paige is saying that's a, a good tactic. Um, all kinds of things. You just end up having a ton of wisdom. And I think it's just from, hey, this worked. Or, yeah. And, you know, that's the one bad thing is that we don't talk about our rates so much. I remember somebody had done a, a mark for me. And I was like, they were like, well, just pay me what you can. And I'm thinking, oh, well, you know, I've been in the business 20 years. You've been in the business 12. Okay, well, what, you know, what do you want? And he was like, gave me a number that I was like, I was like, well, what do you normally charge? I want to pay you what, you know, because I didn't ask for the mark, but I liked it. And so he was like, oh, it's blank. And I'm like, oh my goodness, I am not charging enough. This, mm. this person is charging way more than what I charge. So yeah. As, as a result, I raised my price and I felt better because there was a market standard. So I feel like there's, um, maybe that's what we need. We need to just be more open and honest with each other. And I do think yes. it comes with experience, right? It yes. has that I've had this many years and I've done this, but you know, if you can find somebody who is in your, this kind of the same quality and yes. giving even as you're doing products, I think where people are like, oh, well, what do you charge for that product? How did you come up with $19 or $39? You know, 
Well, mm. it, you have all these things. Cause I feel like mm. in the beginning when you were starting, you probably didn't know, you kind of <laughs> didn't, yeah. didn't know what it would go for. You know, th some things on creative market are $2 and then some mm. things are $67, you know? So mm. there's a wide range. And I'm, I'm actually glad you brought up that particular thing about the industry, because that's the other thing that, that I, I guess it's in my personality and I've always thought this way. I always look at the bigger picture of what I'm doing. And if you think about it, if you're a designer and your, your aim is to charge as little as possible so that you can get the work, all you're really doing is you're lowering, lowering the industry standard each time because that client that you're getting is just going to assume that the next job that he asks for should also be that cheap. And then what happens is it's like you're creating this massive culture of a race to the bottom and none of us win. So I understand it's scary to put up your price, but you have to also see it as a, um, it's a healthy um, development for the industry that you're in. And, and I'm not saying rip people off cause that's terrible as well. I mean, let's face facts. We don't want to be idiots and we don't want right. to be ourselves to people, you know? So you, 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 you still want to be fair, fair to yourself, fair to the client. Um, and, and definitely charge what you're worth. Because as I said, if we're all charging too little, who's winning? It's, it's just the client. We're going to lose, you know? Um, and we right. create this culture that clients think, okay, well design should be cheap and that's wrong. Right. So, um, Kim says, okay, I just need to put on my Lisa Glanz pants now. Yes. You know how we'll say big girl <laughs> panties, maybe. <laughs> so we know we got the Glanz pants. So that's, that's super true. And Andre, he's in Portugal. He says, I'm glad I found a couple of friends that have no problem talking about rates. I do think there's something oh, to brilliant. that, of mm -hmm. that kind of that trust factor of people who aren't going to use it against you, but also say, mm -hmm. Hey, you know what? I think maybe you're not charging enough. Um, yeah. All right. So random question. Uh, Paige asked last time, I think she emailed me this and I forgot to ask a uh, random question. She says, where did you get your standing desk that's behind you? Oh, um, it's, it's a South African company. I'm trying to think of the name. It's something like deskstand.co.za, something like that. I could be wrong. Um, I'm sure they ship worldwide as well. So yeah, just Google Destan. I think it was Destan dot Sierra Zere, something like that. So what's Sierra Sere? How do you spell dot, that? Oh, sorry. Dot C O dot Z A. Oh, uh, dot co uh, dot co. I dot got Z. it. Sorry, yeah. Oh. The Z, the Z thing threw us uh, off. It's Z, the Z. Uh, I'm like, Z. I heard Sierra Sede. And I'm, I'm like, Ooh, what is that? Sierra my Sede. Terrible <laughs> South African accent. Sorry. No, Lisa. Oh my goodness. Your accent is amazing. Okay. So, uh, I think you said desk stand that yeah. I'll put it in the show notes. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll have a look afterwards and, and definitely send you the link. Okay. Um, no problem. All right. So, um, all right. So I was just trying to make sure that I got every, um, and, and, uh, Paige also says, boy, you're just really dropping some truth bombs, which I totally, totally agree. Okay. So another thing that, uh, again, we're just in question one, but tooting your own horn, I think, yeah. so I think that comes with time and experience. The first time you do it, yeah. it's very uncomfortable. It's mm -hmm. just like marketing your products, right? So maybe that's the next step we'll do. But when you're talking to a client or if you, um, so what if, and I don't know if you can remember back to this. So your first kind of fabric um, client or product that you did, um, it was maybe the first time you'd worked with them. So you, you, or first time at all ever. And so you don't really know what you're doing, but you're taking a chance and saying, I still have good work. It's just technical skills really that you, you need yeah. to um, figure out, right? Mm. How thick Absolutely. lines need to be or whatever for the kind of mm. weave of fabric, right? Yes, exactly but you have to take those chances. So what, um, how do you, if, if they were like, well, it's between you, Lisa and somebody else, why should we go with you? And not that they ever say that, but really that's what they're asking. Right. Mm. So how, cause I think tooting our own horn, marketing our work, and maybe you can just talk about how you market your products and how, um, you know, some people do, Every day they're sending stuff out. Some people 
it, I think it can be very numbing, right? Mm. But it's very uncomfortable. I know my sister said one time, she's like, well, Diane, you only told people once about it. People aren't going to open that email. Maybe, you know, she's like, you got to be, you know, resilient. You got to keep coming back. And so mm. there's, there's something. So it is kind of about tooting your own horn with the client. So you've given us lots of verbiage, which I think you need to make an e into an ebook. <laughs> um, <do> <laughs> But then there's also, because I think um, it's just uncomfortable. Again, we're going back to that uncomfort, but that's mm. how we grow, right? Yeah. So can you give any other advice about either marketing a product and tooting your own horn? Like if you're, I know they're well, sort of similar, but not exactly. Yeah, the, the I guess it depends on where you are in the phase of your development and, and, and your business. But if I just take, mine for example um i understand what you mean you have this initially when i first started out i did i have had this like eek factor like oh my goodness i'm like sending emails out to people i mean back then it was probably like only a thousand who had signed up and now i'm basically telling them you must buy my product you know and um, it felt uncomfortable but you know over the years i've learned people have signed up to my newsletter because they want to read what I'm doing and they want to be told, who, mm. you know, what my next product is and they want to, uh, they want to see what I'm doing, what I'm up to. So they, they signed up because they want to. <laughs> so we're doing them a disservice by not letting them know what your latest product is or what you're doing or is there a discount or so even though you are getting, obviously there's a percentage of people who signed up just for the freebie or, you know, aren't really that interested in, in what you're doing or whatever. Um, but generally those that have, or a same with a client, clients approached you probably based on something that they saw that you'd created. So you, you, you need to know and remember that because that is what your, um, your, your selling factor is. You know, they, they want you, they don't want anybody else. They don't want Sarah down the road. They actually want you. Um, mm -hmm. that's why they came to you. That's why they signed up for your list. That's why, you know, they're, they're browsing your website. So, believe in that and believe in yourself enough to know that there's nothing wrong and it's not, it's, it's, you're not being uh, vain or whatever by saying, Hey, this person actually likes what I do. You know, that's, that's the whole point. <laughs> um, you know, and, and I think it depends on, on a lot depends on your uh, integrity and your, mm. what's the word? Um, um, the basis from, from your intention, that's the word, sorry, mm. the intention of like, if you spare me and you're sending an email right. every day and buy my stuff, buy my stuff, that's horrible. But if your intention is to make the world a better place through your work, I know this sounds cheesy, but I mean, that's, if that's your intention, there's nothing wrong with that. People want it. People want to connect with it. So well, and they're also part of your process. If you're including them in not just telling them about the product, here's the product, buy it, here's the product, buy it, but hey, here's yeah. how I came up with this. Here's the story. Because you say you always come up with these stories that, yes. you know, the bunnies or the bears or whatever doing. Yes. But it kind of goes back to, uh, maybe you can tell us about this. In the beginning, you were doing things like logos and other things on creative market. But when you started tapping into your personality is mm. when... Um, it's like you, instead of we me and you were talking about this Brene Brown, uh, fitting in and belonging and the yes. fitting in is changing yourself to fit somebody else's thing. Belonging is yeah. somebody accepts me for who I am. And I feel like in the yeah. beginning, a lot of, a lot of people do this. This is not just mm. a Lisa Glanz thing. We all kind of do this until we Absolutely. find our, our voice, right? Mm. So in the beginning, you were doing all kinds of things, but then you started getting traction when you started putting your personality in. And it is uncomfortable because we are sensitive because then I made this and if everybody hates it, but at, there's some point that it doesn't matter. Like, but I like it, you know, like there, I think everybody can find to tap into something and they're like, I don't care if nobody gets it. I like this. And I think it's yeah. finding those bits maybe mm. but do you remember that and what happened when you finally found like let your personality really come really strongly in your work well yeah it's um it was actually i mean it's not it's not moments that you often have in your life but this honestly was a moment for me when i was you know messing around and because uh, that's what i do a lot i do a lot of technique 
exploration. I do a lot of skill exploration and kind of like find out what I like and don't like. And it was one of those days when I was thick into it. Um, and I drew something in closer to the style that I am currently doing. And it was almost like, I can't explain it to you. Like the circle fitting into its place. <laughs> it was weird. Like, I, cause I always felt like I was out of place in a way. And, and it was, it was literally like I dropped into the slot and I literally mm -hmm. out loud said, Oh my God, this is it. <laughs> and it was, it was, it was quite a moment for me because it, it really felt like this is who I am. This is my style. This is my expression. This is, you know, all those good stuff things. And, um, since then the, the creating and the designing and, you know, my whole process has become so much easier because now it feels like home. Whereas before, mm. as you said, we're all trying to like, fit in you know and it's hard because it means that you've got to force yourself into something that you're not necessarily you know you're not you know are you know you're not those kind of things and when you actually finally do s stuff that is more you it's so much easier and mm. it's just lighter and yeah so that did change it changed my whole direction of what kind of products i started creating it stopped that whole fight that you have inside mm of, oh, I've got to do the next one. It's got to be better than this. And so what happens is you stop, um, you, you try and you get off that rat wheel uh, mm. much easier that way. Like that whole sort of cycle of I've got to produce, it's got to be good if no one likes it. And you know, that whole thing. Um, yeah. So, so what happens is you, you start getting joy in what you create. And because of that joy, people feel the joy. Because if you think about it, people buy from people you know, they don't buy from robots, they don't buy from computers, they're buying work from me or you or, you know. So if people can feel that through your work, then generally it, it, it'll, do, it'll do well, you know. Right. And maybe that's also where some of the marketing, your stuff comes in, where you get to share your joy, right? Yes. Um, I think Tom had y'all all say what each other's one word or Oh, yes. more word. And, <laughs> and, and, some of these weird ideas, yeah. <laughs> And I think one of them was joy. And I don't know if you said that or if he said that about your, I think he said whimsical or something, but yeah. I think joy is like, no matter what the characters are, they are just joyful. You know, they're just super cute anyway. Um, so this really, that's a great transition when you talk about technique kind of exploration and skill exploration. So you actually started this, I think it, 68 days ago or 64 days ago. I can't remember what this, the ostrich, is that the most recent, you know, how yeah. the algorithm? Uh, I did one, I did one girl this morning. Okay. I didn't get to finish, but yes. Ostrich. Okay. <laughs> it didn't get to finish in five minutes. I'm just kidding, Lisa. I know it takes a little longer than five minutes. But this is where, this is an example of how you are taking this and still um, pushing yourself. Mm. Um, so on comfort side, business-wise, you've done the Honest Designers podcast and now it is more comfortable and you're comfortable doing this. And y'all yeah. are like almost, maybe for a year almost, yeah, I think it is almost a year. It's yeah. been a while. Yeah. It has. Mm. Um, so, but then um, you talked about this like um, exploration. So some things I'm sure you've tried that just don't fit, whether it's a mm. different style of brush or pen, right? Or what are some things yeah. that maybe you've done that you're like, nah, I just didn't feel like. Yeah, the um, it, it's still quite a popular technique amongst illustrators is actually inking. And, um, that just doesn't suit my style. Um, I've tried it. Um, and yeah, I just find that, that whole, the whole brush pen or the whole brush ink thing, um, for lines and line work and that kind of thing is just too, it's too heavy for, for the feeling that I'm trying to convey in my work. So yeah, it, you've got to try these things. Otherwise you never figure out, you know, what sits and what doesn't, because if a client comes to me and says, Hey, we want you to do this and we want to use it in, in the brush pen style, I'll be able to say up front, um, it's not going to work. <laughs> I've tried right. it. it. It doesn't look good. So you've got to know your style and what suits, you know, for, for a whole lot of reasons. So, right. yeah. 
So, so then as you've done this five minute drawing, just in case somebody doesn't know, you've been doing it for every day. It takes maybe a little bit longer than five minutes. But one of the reasons was because you weren't as comfortable on the iPad, right? Yeah. I, I was actually only using Procreate every now and then in my work. Um, I was literally only using it to, I guess, do the color work of my work. Um, so my appropriate procreate skills were in not so good. So I, I really wanted to improve that because I mean, when I see some of the procreate artwork out there, it's unbelievable. I mean, what people are putting together is crazy. So yeah, I was, I was desperate to improve those skills. So I chose that app, um, to, to do my drawings on. It's also a great way to add color quickly, you know, to work. All right. So, um, and you know, they come with brushes. Did you make any of your own since I know that, or did you just buy Ian's cause you just want I've, to support Ian? Yeah, I've, <laughs> I've bought, I've bought a few. Um, and I'd say that the, 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 the brush I use the most is actually the built in pencil, the six B. Mm -hmm. uh, then there's a couple of charcoal brushes that I bought that I use and I love. And there's a couple of texture ones that I also use that I also bought that, but you honestly don't even have to, because you could use the stuff that comes as default. It's amazing. What's, what's included. Um, and yeah, and it's so easy to make your own if you really wanted to. This morning right. I, I, I started making a pattern brush. So yeah, it's very easy to make. Awesome. Mm. All right. Mm. So how often are you pushing yourself with technical skills or uh, like, you've kind of got the hand, I think after 60 something days with procreate, right? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. And now it's maybe fun and you really like the challenge. Um, and we'll get into this, but how often are you trying something else new? Is it like once a week, once a month, once a quarter? Um, it, I can't even say that it's like a, um, sort of scheduled, scheduled yeah, yeah. time. It's more about how I feel at the time. Like I, I go through phases where I'm so heavy into a particular project that I'm working on. Um, and then once I'm done, I feel like I need to just create for the sake of creating because, mm. you know, working like on a project can actually sap you, you, know, you <laughs> yes. can, you know, especially, I mean, I love doing the portrait creator, but it, it, it is extremely energy sapping. Um, so yeah, once I do an update, once I'm finished, I just have this like need to just mess around. So then generally what I do is I, I hop into Skillshare and I start looking through all the amazing classes that they have there. Um, and the thing is about Skillshare, what's, what's so cool is that even though the class seems like entry level or beginner level, you can always learn something from it. I mean, I've watched, you know, entry level things like how to draw, how to paint a, a flower. I mean, I've done that a hundred times myself, but that person could be giving me insight into something I never even thought of. And I mean, I, I have discovered um, tools in Illustrator. I mean, I thought I knew Illustrator so well. <laughs> um, I've discovered like tools in Illustrator, like, well, at least their potential of that tool, you know, you know, it's there, but you don't hardly ever use it. And, and it's amazing. It's, you can really learn. You can always, always learn something. So you're sure. never too experienced to go back to the beginning because oh, everybody gosh. does something differently. I totally agree with you. I'm right yeah. there, right there mm. with you. All and, right. And, so, sorry, and, and just on a note on going back, to basics, even with drawing, um, I've started doing going back to drawing basics in terms of uh, the human form, mm. because you you get so stylized in the work that you do that you start forgetting the the anatomy of stuff. So mm -hmm. your drawing could start looking a little off um, because of it. So yeah, it's good to it's good to uh, brush up. Mm. All right, so. One of the things you and I talked about when we did our test and we didn't really get into it last week. So this is one of the things I love. This is again, a mental thing, which we talked a lot about last time. But one of the things with this five minute drawing was about decisions and that yes. you had to come in with some decisions. So I want you to kind of, if you can kind of give people an idea and, and how it helps you to make decisions quicker. Mm. So with the five minute drawing, obviously five minutes is not a long time. <laughs> um, so before each drawing, I already know, oh, I have a broad idea of what color palettes I'm going to use. And I don't spend too long on making the decision because that whole point of the five minute drawing was to be quick. So I have a, a, quite a few palettes that I've saved um, in, in Procreate. And then I just literally pick one. 
I set it to default and I know out of that palette I'm going to use three colors so or three or four colors or whatever and and so that's really cool so it's so nice to not faff and fiddle and um and ah oh over the color palette because I mean as creators we all know how that can take you down a rabbit hole and then you just go around and around in circles um so definitely I have found to do my color prep ahead of time, which is different to how I always have been creating. I, n I normally sort of create and then mess around with the color afterwards. So that's been a quite a good thing. Um, the other thing is I ha I'm forced to um, break down my subject, whatever I'm drawing, whether it's a girl or a rabbit, it's a bunny or whatever, um, into shapes. Whereas, I mean, I know I, d I do that anyway, but I don't have a choice with the five minute drawings. You have to. <laughs> <laughs> because if you don't do your initial shape breaking down, it's uh, yeah yeah. I'm not I'm not good enough yet to be able to just throw it together without that. Um, but I'm getting to that point where I'm I can leave certain shapes out, you know, just to get my my basics going. So that's been brilliant. And the other good thing is I found that I'm sketching a lot mm. quicker, you know, whereas before I'd be trying to get to an end result too soon as mm. you know when i start out now i'm allowing myself to okay the first couple of strokes and or the first say minute of my mm. sketching is loose um mm. whereas before i try and aim too much for the end result too soon so yeah that that's helped me um quite a lot as well so do you think it's helped this is a side question and then i have another side question do you think it's helped you when you actually do it in per in real life with a real pen yeah. okay Gosh. the other day i i because i hadn't drawn on paper for so long like say maybe two weeks which is bizarre i mean i'm like a paper pencil person um and wow i've whipped something up so fast i was like wow this is amazing <laughs> you know the speed um of, of how quickly i put it together and i can only attribute it to the fact that it's it's the five minute drawings it's it's amazing yeah yeah, yeah i think that's great translatable skills that it's physically it's a motion a hand motion and i think it's yeah. having the apple pencil more like exactly. a pencil so that it's not it's, your finger yeah. right yeah it's it's um you know, it's muscle memory. So if mm. you are doing the same thing repetitively every day, whether it's, you know, it's different shapes, but what, what I'm saying is you're associating your brain to be participating in an, in an activity. And with that activity obviously comes muscle action. Mm -hmm. And whether you're doing it on a, you know, an iPad or, or on paper or a canvas or a wall, or whatever, it's still the same things. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it just improves your skills dramatically. So I have to say all those artists out there who are um, attached to paper and pencil like I was, I really was. I, I, I almost had like a, a reaction to digital work. I, I, I just thought there's no ways I'm going digital ever, you know. Um, it's been it's been so beneficial from that point of view because it is it has really improved my, my paper and pencil work. That's awesome. Okay, so the other question that's still connected to that. So you, so you have your color palettes. What about subject matter? Is it like, oh. you know, today I feel like an ostrich. Like, how do you come up? I mean, well, some things okay. seem sort of out of, I don't know. Like, yeah, an ostrich seems out of normal for you. Um, yeah. Okay, well. But it was great, by the way. Oh, thank you. Um, I, okay, subject matter is a little bit of an issue sometimes, what I actually did was I signed up to um, Christine, I've forgotten her surname. She's from Might Could, um, Might Could Studios, Drawing Studios. Anyway, she, she started a drawing challenge where she'd send you a prompt every Monday for the week. Um, one was dogs, so I drew dogs for seven days. One, and the most recent one was birds. That's why you saw birds for seven yeah. days. Um, so it's great to have somebody else making those decisions for you. Um, in the one way it's great. On the other hand, it's challenging because man, like seven days of drawing birds. <laughs> <laughs> Christine Fleming, Scott says, oh, thank but you, she, thank but you. she, uh, she got married and he can't think of her name. Yeah, so. that's it. It was, um, with surname. So that's why. <laughs> yes, it's her. Um, and yeah, so it's good from that point of view. Um, yeah. So do, the, when, when you have a prompt, so do you ever like, oh man, I don't want to draw 
birds for seven days? Do you ever switch the sixth day and draw something or do you stick with it because you know you get better when you push yourself? I have to be honest, some of the prompts that she put out, <laughs> I, I didn't participate in because, uh, you know, just, just didn't tickle my fancy. And, and that is probably not a good thing. I should have probably pushed through and done it anyway. Um, but there have been times in the prompts that I've chosen to do that I, I felt, no, I must stick to it, even though I didn't want to draw another bird, um, because it also mimics that whole thing of client work. If you think mm. about it, your clients ask you to do something. And you're like, Oh, don't really have to, um, <laughs> you know, and, and you have to. So yeah, it was good from that point of view. Um, but I also don't want to torture myself by putting right. myself through, uh, you know, stuff I really don't want to do. So it was good from a, a lot of perspective. So Andre asked a question a while ago and I said I would get back to it. So he said, how often do you actually complete the Skillshare class? Most of the time I watch, but I don't necessarily do the project. Are you actually doing the project or are you oh, just God. watching to get <laughs> Sorry, no. <laughs> All right, uh, so Andre had a hashtag shame. So no shame involved, buddy. You're fine not doing the I project. I have never done one Skillshare project, <laughs> not one. <laughs> and I have to admit because, uh, okay, I'm a bit of a freak. I always put it on like one and a half speed because I just want to get through it. <laughs> Um, so I, I yeah. agree when some people are doing it, I'm like, look, buddy, you could speed yeah. that up and I could get the idea a little bit quicker. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, some of the, some of the, the, the classes, like they're worth, um, doing exercises that they prompt you to do. That's definitely like, like I recently, uh, you know, looked at the body, um, anatomy class and I absolutely, I did some of the, the subjects, you know, that he, that he spoke about, but the actual class project now. <laughs> all right so andre you don't have to feel bad at all so no. <laughs> how long do you see yourself doing this five uh even five to whatever minute drawing mm. daily challenge i'd like to think i'm probably delusional i'd like to think forever that is delusional um but i i mean let's face it like if doing something every day will just make you better. Mm -hmm. um, so if I can find literally five minutes a day forever to just doodle or draw something or whatever, I can only imagine that it makes you better and better. So yeah, I'd, li I'd, I'd like to continue as much as, as far as I can at least. So sometimes I think having the business um, mind on, and I don't think Dustin would care. So that I say this, he has said he doesn't want to sell his drawings, but he really could. He could package these things up that oh, he's doing. Exactly. They're incredible, right? He's mm. done a really good job, but he's just doing it. So sometimes having, um, you know, we have to get to that place to be able to feel like I could just do this. I don't know how this is going to impact my business, mm. but you Sometimes you just have to trust your gut and have faith that this might do something. Do you ever yeah. do anything like that? Or is, are, are you still making kind of like, and I think Dustin's in a place because he has some other people that work with him um, that he feels like he can maybe, I don't know how he can with three kids, but whatever. I know. It's crazy. <laughs> it's crazy. Um, yeah, I think, uh, well, in my case, it obviously will have an impact on my business because it's improving my skills. So, um, if it is, say I decided to take up knitting, um, then I can only imagine that would be helpful in terms of a stress relief, I guess, mm -hmm. um, or taking your mind off your work and allowing your brain to recharge and, and refresh. So I, I really believe that anything creative, is going to benefit you, whether it's going to end up being a money thing or whether it's going to end up just being the fact that you are allowing yourself to be a human being again and, and less stressed, you know? Um, yeah, it's, it's like, like taking up running. I mean, if you take up running, that's a stress reliever. Plus you get fit, plus you might lose weight, you know? So right. other yeah. benefits, right. Mm. Yeah. Well, and this is still sort of in the realm, but he would never say that he was, 
um, an illustrator, I don't think, but he's totally an illustrator. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, he, I remember having conversations with him. He's like, well, I'm not really a designer. I'm just the the business person. I'm like, buddy, you're a designer. Yeah. uh, You got to just claim it. And I think some people, like we were talking about illustration, he sort of feels like that. And, um, I do think having something that you don't maybe know where it's going to go, it, it, that it's just you're committing to do something to challenge yourself in new ways. I think it's like reading yeah. a book that's not a, a normal, I remember the first time I read kind of a psychology book, I was like, well, I don't know, but I mm. loved it, right? And it, mm. it, it impacts other things in your Oh, in, your, in your life, right? I mean, you know, anything that, that contributes to your self-improvement can only be beneficial no matter what, uh, you know, whether it's from a business point of view or, uh, you know, your personal life. It's, you can only, I mean, I guess that's that's our jobs, at least, at the very least, as, as, as a soul, as a human being, is to be the best version that you can be. And, and I think in order to do that, you have to be humble enough to know that you there's always room for improvement. You can always grow no matter how good you are at a particular thing. And, and even if you're tired of doing a, you know, one task or one skill, definitely explore other things. I mean, that's, that's why I still do my dancing. I, I, I go once a week because it's like, it's my way of just getting out of the office. I have to do it because it, otherwise I just never get out of the office. Right. You know? So there, there are so many things that you can do to benefit yourself that, that aren't necessarily related to your job that will, you know, come back and impact positively on your job. Absolutely. Yes. All right. So, um, how do you find trends or I know you guys have talked about this on honest designers and sometimes yeah. it's like trends are something that you, I mean, colors are trends. I think, you know, yeah. especially in fabric and stationery. Um, and I know you have a really big Pinterest account. Is that somewhere that you're going to kind of watch these or do you just go to the store and you're like, okay, I'm picking up on things or look in magazines or is there yeah. kind of a hidden <clears throat> secret for Lisa for, <laughs> um, there, there are actually three places that I use a lot. Pinterest is definitely one of them, but you have to be careful about Pinterest because generally, as I'm sure you all know that the algorithms are set up to your taste. So whatever you've been looking for a lot, that's what they'll send you. Right. So you need to, you need to somehow, you know, search for other things that aren't necessarily in your standard feed. Um, the other thing I look at a lot is Etsy. Um, mm. Etsy is a huge trend sort of research area because you can figure out what are customers buying, mm. what are they looking for, and even if you know if, if you're looking into selling products or downloadable products or whatever, if you just do that search in the Etsy um, you know search bar, it, it gives you suggestions, um, and that that is an indication of what the most common things people are, are looking for. So that's a huge help. And then, of course, the other thing is the, the general marketplace where you sell your work. Um, that also gives you an idea of what people are buying a lot of, what they like, what mm. is still trending. I mean, there was a time where people thought, gosh, how long is this watercolor flower thing going to go on? And it's still going. It's still going <laughs> strong, in fact. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's, um, it's a huge indicator, I guess, because customers still want it still buying it so yeah all right so you have a ton of hats that you wear and you talked on the show about um tom really challenged you to not work seven days a week and (laughs) to maybe get some help so you have done that you have somebody who's helping you you kind of found so Mm. And you wanted somebody who was a little bit more experienced, but kind of wanted to break in so that into selling products and things. So there, yeah. there was a benefit for her because you would kind of let her um, hear, understand your, that side of the business. Mm-hmm. And so you felt like you were giving, I think, something as well. Because I yeah. think that was the one thing that I kept hearing you say was, well, I don't want to make them do something that I, I you know I would be really sad that if I had to do emails or do kind of what we think of as grunt work, but, mm. um, you know, it's just part of, you were doing it, you know, as know. the owner. <laughs> uh, so but it's my business, but yeah, it's true. I, I look, I mean, I still, I mean, obviously it's, 
you know, early days um, with, <laughs> with, with the design, you know, new person that I have. So I'm still struggling to let go. Um, I think a lot it's of un- it has, it's uncomfortable, right? It's uncomfortable. And I, I mean, I am a, a full blown perfectionist <laughs> and I have a particular way that I want things done and want things to look. And, um, so it's really difficult for me to let go of stuff. And I mean, obviously, which is ridiculous because how is anyone ever going to help you if you don't give them a chance? But I always think, man, I could do that faster, you know, or, or whatever. Yeah. But the point is that how will you ever train that person if you don't actually, you know, give right. them stuff to do. So it is a bit of a learning curve for me. And, um, <clears throat> the biggest challenge is, is letting go the full control you know, of stuff and also understanding that, you know, it's their point of view. It's like, it's their design aesthetic. Obviously it needs to mimic mine as much as possible because it's my brand, but I mean, there's nothing wrong with them approaching something differently. And it's like, (laughs) there's like a little thing that goes off in my brain that I feel like, Oh my God, like there's a short circuit, you know, how could don't do it that way. Don't do it that way. But there's nothing wrong with doing it that way. Right, right, right. It's that whole control freak in me. And yes, it's a learning curve, but I think I'll get there. This is to my benefit. (laughs) Absolutely. So So have you been able to kind of unplug on the weekends or not draw as much or? Yeah, you know, you know what I and, and it's it's not due to um, Julie helping me yet. It's not because she's helped me so much. I can. What I've actually decided to do, I'm hoping that that it will be more and more. But this year, I've decided to do less. It's just crazy. I mean, the fact is that it, the bottom line is it's all self-inflicted. I mean, mm. obviously, there's there's a couple of things you can't get away from. You have to do customer service, and you have to, you know, but you don't have to answer it every day like clockwork or you know spend five hours a day doing that you can do less and less you know it doesn't have to be so um i think what what i suffer from is i give too much of myself Mm. you know to other things rather than uh spending not enough time on creating so Mm. yeah so i've tried to really concentrate on doing that more this year you know of, of choosing my time a bit better. So when you were starting, and I don't know if you can remember this far back, but when you were starting and we talked about this the other day, um, Mm. how were your business goals? Like, like Dustin was releasing a product. I think him and Ian both were releasing a product once a week, It's crazy. (laughs) which is, or once every two weeks or something, but it, it was a lot. And, but that was really all, um, I mean, he was having to do that, right? Dustin was. And so how do you set your goals up or how would you tell somebody who, who maybe is thinking about selling products? Maybe they're uh, a really successful illustrator currently, Mm -hmm. but they just want to kind of have another line of income. What, what kind of business goals, like how many products a year would you say? um, And how do you come up with those goals for you? Okay. Well, if I was talking to a new person trying to get into the industry the first question I'd ask was who is your target market and what kind of products do you want to create so you can do really small sets that you know um, you know that a mom is looking for to to create something small little craft item and and do really small set sell it for three bucks Um, or are you hoping to attract a uh, more sort of experienced customer that maybe is a designer or has their own shop um, and you want to bundle a whole lot more things together that is an an all-encompassing sort of product for that particular theme then you go for a bigger product and then do less of those so if you're going to go with a small you know little bits say 10 10 items per product then you can do then you can literally do one a week you know mm-hmm. um, but if you if you want to rather because this is, this is how I approach my business. Um, I know that my um, customer base is, you know, they're either designers or small business owners. Um, and I basically aim to create quite substantial products and that, that are obviously a bit more expensive, relatively, obviously talking. Um, and 
I, I don't plan to bring out as much as I can. It's more, okay. well, obviously I do, but what I'm saying is I don't, my plan isn't to churn them out. I, I'd rather concentrate on, on doing my research, putting together quality stuff that I know that they're going to use, um, spending a lot of time on presentation and making sure that things are, you know, so easy for them to use, that, that it's easy for them to use the product. And then, um, yeah, I, I put that out. So my amount of products I do every year is quite low. It's probably about eight, eight products a year. They, there's a few, I'd say 50% are seasonal. I think that's hugely important. You must remember that. Um, so things like winter, Christmas, summer, spring. Um, I wouldn't do the small holiday things unless you stick to the, like the small packs. Um, yeah, things like that. So if you think about what your client is and what you think they're going to need and want and focus on that. So when you're doing, so say you're releasing a Christmas pack. I think about mm-hmm. when we are when in the magazine business, you work six months ahead, right? Yeah. Um, and granted, if you're trying to market to your audience on your list and you're talking, it's July and you're doing Christmas, it seems awkward. But again, that's yeah. knowing your audience, right? But a designer yeah. is also working ahead. So say you're doing Christmas, maybe you market that or you put it out, you release it in October, at the beginning of October or something. And if you were doing yeah. something for Halloween, do y'all do Halloween over there? Uh, yes, we have. We do do Halloween, yeah, which is weird because it's doesn't come from our culture but they've kind of like adopted it <laughs> so yeah halloween is is live and well <laughs> so but it's about kind of knowing when a designer would need to do something to get it printed so that their clients could send yes. it out so it's it having that designer as your audience um i think for digital products is really important and really helpful yeah. but when you're marketing that mm-hmm. if you're marketing that to your list when when would you market a christmas would you i mean is there a uh, I'm, I was just thinking when you said Christmas and that, you know, 50% is seasonal and you're talking about summer. Mm. They, you see, it depends on the kind of product you're putting out. So I have done sometimes two Christmas products, one bigger one um, that I probably market in November Mm-hmm. That goes out and I let people know it's, you know, in November. And then there's the smaller, and I sometimes do a quick smaller product that is for the kind of last minute Christmas stuff. So you've got to bear that in mind. So maybe you're including pre-made cards, you including mm. designs that they can throw together and put on the Instagram. So, you know, again, so think about the end user, mm. how they're going to use it, how, how is it going to be beneficial to them? And if you're doing that kind of pack, you can sell it even right up until the 15th of December and even beyond, you know? Right. So right. yeah, it, it, it definitely depends on, on your purpose of your product. Um, and then think accordingly. And it's, it's so strange because I've actually, I've sold December, uh, uh, Christmas products like right through December um, that I think would be too late, mm-hmm. but it's not. I mean, there's still people who are, you know, needing graphics for that. So, yeah. Hmm. Well, I mean, it's good to know, but it's also that you've mm. built this up and that um, people can come to your site, do a search, and then they can find things that they're looking for, multiple packs yes. or multiple different things because you yes. are now this resource that they have. And so it's it's about building a relationship, I think, and having Correct. that um, that email list that mm. sees you as that um, relationship. Because yeah. you'll have sales. I think you're running a sale. Mm. Maybe now, I think. Uh, yeah, they just in, finished. Was yeah. it was the for the spring set? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you, you eventually your audience gets to know your work and what you produce. So I mean, people were expecting a spring, you know, set from me, and 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 you just know that they, you know, that that you have a willing uh, client base, which is fantastic, you know, and and that that takes um yeah, it takes it takes a bit of building up, and once you're there, it's it's quite a nice thing, you know, to have this like market that's out there ready waiting for you to bring out your next pack. Yeah. Okay. So two questions. Andre has a question about, do you think that the email list is better, is a better way to share the new products or the social networks also help? Um, email by far um, is more successful, but obviously social networks does help. Um they, uh, look, I, 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 correct me if I'm wrong because I'm nowhere near a marketing guru, but 
by far an email list is your number one source of growing your business and, and getting sales. It's without a doubt. And so you use the free, there, get this free pack. So that's like one of your um, lead magnets, yes. right? And yeah. so having something that people will get and then they, um, then they yeah. continue coming back, right? Yeah, yeah. The, the, the whole idea behind that free pack was to obviously give them an incentive to, to sign up. But at the same time, I also wanted to show them the quality of my work mm -hmm. and I wanted to show them what they, what they can expect from me. So, I mean, if you're going to, if you're going to offer something free, it must be good. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't give them junk because mm -hmm. you know, then they're going to judge that junk on, they're going to think that your rest of stuff is like that. So that's why I give them one of my better products. And, um, I think that's quite important. It's, it also, you know, gives them a sense of trust and, um, and also it's an introduction, as I said, into, into the rest of your stuff, like how your files are laid out and what they can expect from you and all that kind of thing. So yeah, bear that in mind when you give away freebies, it, it, it must be top quality. So when you started, did you, um, you didn't give away your, I mean, what did you, did you start giving away? Like how many years in? Um, no, months. the, the, the giveaway thing was the, the current giveaway only happened when I created my new website, which has been coming for two years now. Um, previously, I think I did give something away, but it probably wasn't all that good because <laughs> I didn't know what I was doing. Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, but since the whole, uh, you know, rebranding or new website and my whole approach changing and everything it's it's yeah it's taken quite a steep build up so it's yeah it's good so then what about so it is summer ending of summer going to fall for you is yes. that weird to work and how what yeah. per, so you you just released spring so what percentage of your customers are um on the northern hemisphere or in like do you have 80 percent from the united states and do you yeah, know your say, percentages? Yeah, I'd say about as high as probably a 70 to 80% are from the US. Um, and then the rest are, you know, the UK and Europe. Um, and then there's, the, you know, there's still the, 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 the southern parts are much less. Like there's Australia and um, small, small South African market because we're not, we don't have the culture of online shopping mm. yet so much. Um so yeah, I mean that's that's why I guess the American market is so big because you guys completely live like that. That's like your culture. We don't need to leave, right? Everything yeah. gets delivered. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So what's something that we should talk about that um, I haven't asked you about? Um. Well, I, we have spoken about it before, but I just think it's so important to you know look at again is that whole as, as creators and, and somebody who's trying to change their life or change what they want to do, you know, we sit the ceiling, um, mm. ourselves. Um, I, I have a friend who, uh, he's been in the same job for, she's not, she doesn't do design or anything, but this is an example of, of her internal vote, like conversations that she has going on. Um, you know, like I, she's been wanting to open her own deli for so long and, um, I always say to her, just do it. Like, you know, like, yes, it's going to be rough. You probably need a loan from the bank and all that kind of stuff. And it's going to take hard work, but then it's going to be yours and it's all worth it. And just, but, but I'm just not that, I, the world isn't like, it's not for me. Like the world, I, I don't think that's my place. I'm not meant to, I'm not meant to be something important or I'm not meant to be great. And mm. she has literally put that, ceiling on herself and because she believes that she's never going to do it you know until she breaks that and I think I mean I was doing that to myself for years I mean I really honestly believe that I was not an illustrator I didn't have the talent I mean why would I even bother um, you know I just wouldn't make it all those kinds of things those conversations that I was having in my my head it, it, a lot of it is even subconscious you don't even know you're doing it and it's that that, that determines your future and it's that's what's creating your environment and until you can break through that you're going to believe it and it's going to just be your reality so you can really honestly and truly change 
your, your reality. How did you change that for you? Because I do think that is that a huge part is that self-talk and what you it, tell yourself. I tell you, if, if I hadn't found a way to break through that, I wouldn't be where I am now. And it was probably, a, I mean, it sounds dramatic, but it was probably a year of self retraining. I mm. had to, I just knew I had to retrain the way I thought about stuff. And to be quite honest with, I mean, I'm not a, um, I don't belong to a particular religion of any kind, but I'm extremely spiritual. Um, I have a very strong inner spiritual uh, world. And I, I just knew that why would the universe want to hold me back? Why mm. would the universe not want to support me? Why would I, why would the universe not want me to be the best I can be? So taking that and then applying that strong faith that you have um, and that you will be supported because you will, I, I, I guarantee you. I, there's one thing I've learned through all of this stuff is that you will be supported. It, it feels like you won't and it's scary and you know, you have all these questions like from a material point of view, like will you actually earn a living and so on and so on. But I promise you, you will be supported somehow. This stuff happens. And, um, but the only obstacle in the way is you. And, and until mm -hmm. you get through that, it's, it can't change. Sometimes it really does help to believe that somebody else believes in you and yeah. having that, that, um, exterior belief. So yes. sometimes it's about a friend that just believes in you or, or something like that. So, so Paige says flirt with the universe, put the work out there that you want. Absolutely. 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 Kent, Kent has a question. How would you advise students about to graduate and entering into the graphic design profession? Um, I would advise you to don't freak out too much now about um, knowing exactly what you want to do, mm. like your end, say in 10 years time. Don't, don't worry about that. I, I would say in the next two years, gain as much experience as you can. Choose jobs that are going to be challenging. Choose jobs that are going to force you to learn stuff as you go. I know you, you're probably going to think that I'm not capable of doing X, Y, and Z, but you, you'll learn. You'll learn as you go. And it's those jobs that, that set you up to, to the next best job, you know, and, and then you, you know, force yourself to learn even more and so on and so on. And, um, and know that you, yeah, as we, as we discussed, you probably will be taken advantage of, but it's better to be in the trenches than not because mm. it teaches you so much about yourself and design and business. Um, and yeah, just put your head down and work really hard because it pays off. And sometimes those first jobs aren't, you're not necessarily learning a lot about design because you're not no. doing a ton of design. You're actually doing exactly. a lot of production, but you're yes. learning about business and about client relationships yes. and about work relationships and all kinds Correct. of stuff that goes in. So a lot of times people stay at their first jobs, maybe too long and maybe it's yeah. the economy. But I always feel like your first job, especially if you're doing production work and you're not getting challenged to do more design work or you're not getting challenged, yeah. then stay there for a year, year and a half, then mm. move forward to the next thing. Start looking. But some people get lost in that comfort, right? It's, well, yes. I've got a paycheck and I'm afraid if I quit this or, you know, if, I'm afraid if I start looking, then nobody will whatever. Well, well, maybe you're just looking in the wrong market. Maybe you have to move yeah. again. It's un being uncomfortable. So yes. is there anything else you want to add like to somebody who's maybe been working for two years to get out? Cause I think, you know, you go from school where you're working all the time you feel like, Oh my goodness. And then you get out and you have a job and you get to like go home and you don't have mm -hmm. to do that stuff on the weekends. And so like, that was me. Like I, Got, I graduated and I was in Denver and I would go snowboarding and I just had fun. And I actually think there's something wonderful about that. Of course. Yes. But, but at the same time, thinking about your career, it's kind of like, I, I just, I think a mentor would be a great thing for somebody um, that's recently kind of gotten out of school mm. to start looking for about two years out, because I do think you need to challenge yourself. Do you, have you ever used it? Yeah. Think? I mean, look, I think this might be a lot to do with personality um, as well, but sometimes often it is, as you said, you're too scared. The comfort zone is more comfortable, obviously. Um, but I would say if it is exactly what you said, it's not challenging you creatively, 
you need to get out because if you don't, what happens is you get so comfortable um, and, and you stagnate and your design skills go for a ball and your creativity. And before you know it, you're happy being the manager of a production studio, you know, 10 years down the line. And if that, if that is, a, if, if that's your personality, that's great. But if it's not, and you are conning yourself into thinking are you making excuses for yourself because, oh, the economy this, or what if I can't find another job? Or then make a plan to have a, either transition or don't choose a job. Uh, you know, I mean, don't quit your job until you have a new one or whatever. But you can't use those uh, things as excuses if you want to grow. If you want to grow and you want to get better at your skill, eventually have your own business, you've got to make those tough decisions. And also, you know, if you are not ready necessarily to leave the job, then start doing something on the side. Start getting that yeah. side hustle up so that Absolutely. you are ready. Because a lot of times that first job, you're not doing a lot except production work. There's mm. not a lot of design. There's not a lot of concepting. So then you need to do that on the side so that you can say, hey, this is what I can do when you go for that next yeah, job. Yeah, and, and often... Um, you know, you might be in a department in a larger company that does also have a design department and there's nothing wrong with you showing interest in the, in their work and possibly volunteering to do stuff over the weekend for them or whatever. Cause what I'm saying is like, there are so many ways to, to, to improve and at least like get your boss's attention. If that's, you know, that, that's what you need to do, or at least wet your feet in a, in a area and, and get some experience for the next job interview. So you can say, Hey, yes, of course I've, I've designed. Yes, it was on the side or whatever, but I've done it, you know? So it's important to, um, to stretch yourself. Especially when you're young, your brain is fresh. <laughs> Use it. <laughs> right. But I actually think you're a great example of continuing to stretch yourself. And so I feel like with the Honest Designers podcast, that's something, that's another stretch because y'all are coming together. You're being honest about what's going on in your yeah. businesses. So you're stretching your business. So it's what you're reading. It's what you're putting in. It's who you're talking to. Paige asks, how or where do you find or do you look for for mentors? And I would say, do you think that like Dustin, Ian and Tom are all in a way kind of a mentor group for you? Oh, definitely. I would say Tom has helped me um, in that way more. Um, than the other guys because he he recognized in me early on that I was this insecure little illustrator clueless um, you know and he, and he gave me a lot of business advice and um, he was the one who suggested this this hookup and he, he he knew that I was probably shy about it and but he kind of like forced me in a way you know so it it, it is it is a good thing to have somebody to push you because yeah, you're obviously not naturally going to walk into something that's uncomfortable. But right. I guess I, it's, I have this thing, which is, I, I think it's a healthy thing. Um, but the way I say it now, it might sound a little weird. But I, I, I just don't want to be this old woman dying, thinking back, wow, why did you waste your time on stuff that doesn't count? You know, like, why didn't you go all out? Like, even though it was scary, even though it was whatever, like I, I want to be able to say, man, I tried it. I tried it. I did it. I've, I've been on every road that I thought was something worth taking and whether it works out or not, you know? So I think it's important to feel fulfilled at the end of the road and through the journey. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's probably what drives me more than anything. <laughs> Well, Lisa, I can't tell you thank you enough. Thank you so much for all this wisdom. Can't wait for the ebook. We'll be ready to buy. Um, I, I'm serious. Like it would be nice just to have some. You it's a good said idea, it so well. Yeah. It's a, it's different for you, but it it um, is so such good practical things that I just think are are really critical for people. And you've shown yeah. you've gone through that journey, so you have the experience and the proof I think and you just say it in such a great way actually so oh, I'm, 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 I'm looking forward to that ebook <laughs> um, so I want to make sure everybody knows how to follow you and so you can go to lisaglands.com that's G the Lisa like everybody spells Lisa I don't know if Lisa's <laughs> l-i-s-a-g-l-a-n-z and then um, you can find her at Glans Graphics on Instagram. You can also look at her on Instagram at um, 
five, the number five minute drawing, uh, not drawings, just five minute drawing. I'm going to put all these in the chat. And then um, you can check out her shop at lisaglanes.com slash product hyphen category slash graphics, or you just go to the website and go to shop. Um, and then Pinterest, Lisa Glanz Design, Etsy, Lisa Glanz Graphics, and Spoonflower, which we really didn't talk about fabric, but you do a oh, lot yeah. of fabric stuff, which is, you know, kind of another area another niche you know some people might not know you do that they just see certain things and so the fabrics are really great and then they can also always find you on honestdesigners.com as yes. well and so we i did put some of the other um we talked about the um ep other another episode last time the pricing kind of in, and yes, standing up yes. so i put that in the show link so Lisa, thank you so much. I'm uh, glad that I could end your day and start my day and start our day in America with you on the beginning of the week. So it was terrific. You have a great, thank you. Um, so glad that you share and are so willing to share. And thank you for being a little bit over an hour oh. with me. No, well, thank you for having me. I, I feel honored that you invited me twice. Um, yeah, I hope whatever I've contributed has helped people so yeah people are as, uh, you know i'd love to be able to answer every email in a speedy fashion but please do feel free to email me and i will i will try and get back to you if you have any questions related to what we've chatted about awesome well and next mm -hmm. week it'll be back to normal wednesdays all of march was not on wednesdays so now we are going back to normal and wednesday we will bring you scott soder and i'm super excited another illustrator he's done work with highlights he's does a lot of children's kind of illustration he's wow. been in the business so it's a different side of illustration kind of talking about doing more editorial and um he just has a really great style and he was here too so i'm not um and he's still here. So I'm glad you'll be here uh, with Scott next week at normal time, 2.30 Eastern, 11.30 a.m. Pacific. So, <laughs> yes, he says he's still there. Um, uh, and Amy says, yes, she would love that ebook. And so <laughs> you've got people that would buy it from you for sure. Um, definitely excited to have Scott on next week. And always just like it. If you're watching on YouTube, like and share, subscribe. And if you're on iTunes, give us a review. Um, us, meaning me and the mouse in my pocket, I guess. Um, that would help to get the show uh, more known. So I really appreciate everybody who does share. And I really appreciate everybody who comes. And at Creative South, I will be doing a live um, podcast. I know Amy, Brian, and Will are all here. They, were, they will be on the show. We're going to talk about building community um, physically. And um, That's Brian's so cool built a community online. So I think that that's one. And then the other part, so that's part one. And then part two is my little mastermind group. So we're going to take a little tip from the honest designers and we have three of the five people of our mastermind are actually going to creative South. So I'm excited to have them. So the bigger community and then why it's really important to have that smaller mm. um, group of people that you can really share some things with. So Really, we're going to be talking about community. It's from two to three um, at uh, Creative South on Saturday. So it will be, it won't be live, but it will be recorded. So you guys will be able to hear it. And Scott will be at Creative South too. So I'm excited to see a lot of these people in in person. Lisa, I can't wait till you get to come. Um, oh, no. <laughs> I, we got to get you guys there for sure. So. Thank you guys. And you can always follow me at design recharge on everywhere. And then if you want to email me, I'd love to talk to you or email me questions at Diane at recharging you.com. All right, guys. Thanks so much. Bye. <laughs>